If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. All right, just checking. <laughs> Been a good day? Yeah. All right, well, if you're going to have a breakthrough, it's nice to be happy. And if you're going to predict and create your future, it's nice to be happy. But as we learn today, that that's not necessarily true, right? Some pain, some suffering along the way. All right? But it's all worth it because then it creates happiness in the long run, right? I think so. Yes. But it really comes down to, I think, becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. Because comfort never produced greatness. Comfort never produced greatness. But, gosh, it's almost been 20 years now. I did this personal growth training. It was five days in a row, 12 hours a day. And the, the final day was, was designated stretch day. And the purpose of stretch day was to stretch your capabilities in your comfort zone and do something you wouldn't normally do. The assignment was to go out into the community of Chicago where we were having this training and start a meaningful conversation with somebody you wouldn't normally talk to. And the way that you would know if it was a person you were supposed to talk to or not was when your heart was racing with fear. Now I'm going to try to do this with, uh, where's the, the sound coming from here? Normally I would pound my chest, but it's uh, right here. Is it on this side? There it is. Good. I'm just slap myself on the face a couple times and pretend like I'm my heart. Oh, now I'm going to take this right off. All right. I'm going to have to... Can you hear that? Do that with me for a minute. When was the last time you felt your heart race with fear? Okay. So that was, that was how you knew that that was the person you were supposed to talk to when your heart was racing with fear. So I went to a mall in Chicago. And I walked into the food court because I figured maybe that's where my willing volunteer would be. So the first two people I see having lunch are two police officers. Now, police are approachable, right? I mean, they're there to protect and to serve. I mean, not a big deal. Next table, two ladies having lunch. Now, I have been single my entire life. I have been turned down more than a king-size bed at the Ritz. I mean, a little bit more rejection. I mean, no big deal. So I had to look on. Next table. Table for six. Six people at the table. Nowhere to sit. And these people are in their late 70s, 80s, somewhere in that range. And they're speaking a foreign language. They're fighting in a foreign language. Uh, right in the middle of lunch, fighting in a foreign language. Nowhere to sit. I'm thinking, <laughs> I, I can't go over there. And I start to turn away. And what happens? And you know how you know something would be good for you? You know, maybe it was during COVID, making some new choices because you had a little bit more time to think and you thought you better get your life in order. It's making different choices to support, like Rebecca did, what you really want in your life. But then sometimes we hear that little voice in our head that says, oh, maybe now might not be the time to do it. I'll just go back to sleep, right? What do we need to do in those situations? We just need to suck it up and do it. Well, it was part of my assignment, so I didn't have much of a choice. So I went to the table, and I made eye contact with the, the lady at the head of the table, and I said, excuse me, ma'am, um, do you mind if I sit down and, and talk for a little while? And she looks up at me, and in English, she says, what? do you want from us? I really don't want anything. I would just, just love to just sit, and, just sit and talk for a few minutes. She looks up at me. Story to be continued. Okay, so when was the last time your heart raced with fear? I mean, if it hasn't raced with fear in a while, then you're not taking enough risk, right? If you're not living on the edge, 
you're taking up too much space. If you're not scared, it's not big enough. Comfort never produced greatness. Comfort never produced greatness. The true measure of success today is your ability to transition because we are in one permanent state of impermanence. You see, there's three guarantees about change. Number one, it's not going away. It's only coming quicker. Number two, no matter how well planned for, change will never be trouble free. And number three, we are accountable for making it work in our lives. So as we, as we look at our personal lives, as we look at our professional lives, and we, and we try to create the company of the future, I think about a story back, way back in the 1960s of a famous real estate salesman by the name of Robert Patchum. Robert Patchum had the uncanny ability to sell three to four times as much real estate in his big real estate agency than anybody else. And he was a blind man. There was a famous radio commentator in the 60s by the name of Paul Harvey. He had Robert Patchum on his radio show one Saturday morning. He says, Mr. Patchum, he says, tell me, how do you do so well in light of your handicap? And Robert Patchum said, excuse me? In light of my handicap? I'm not sure what you mean. He says, you're a blind man. Do you not consider that a handicap? And Robert Patchum says, not only is it not a handicap, it's my greatest advantage. For it allows me to see what I sell through my customer's eyes. Do you see what you sell through your customer's eyes? And customers' eyes are changing, right? I mean, we heard a little about artificial, uh, artificial intelligence today. It just touched on big data. So it's easier to find out through, through technological terms what, how to better connect with our customers, right? But, but how, how, do we, how do we really figure out what it is that our, that our customers want? What do, we, what do we need to do? The element of surprise, right? To truly delight and surprise those. All right, you, everybody have a bingo card in front of them, right? All right, everybody know how to play bingo? Okay, uh, if you would, mark out that funny looking guy in the middle. That is my, uh, that's your free space, that's me. Um, okay. Five in any direction is what we're going to play. Five diagonally, horizontally, or vertically. Uh, and I only have one prize. I have a few $2 bills, but just one prize. Whoever, if, you, if two of you happen to get it at the same time, whoever screams it the loudest will be declared the winner. Okay? You ready? All right, here we go. B10. B7. O71. I-25, N-41, I-28, I-23, I-30, I-25, N-41, N-35, O-64, O-68, we getting close? Yes. O seventy. N thirty three. G fifty one. <laughs> the element of surprise. <laughs> if you didn't get bingo, you did something wrong. There's actually eight different cards, so everybody at the table has a different card than you. But everybody's winning bingo. The number is. G51. So that's the element of surprise. But the key with surprise is, is it really value to the person that you are surprising? Perceived value is only real value if it's value in the minds of those that you are surprising. So as you look at your customers, as you look at your teams today, how can we surprise? How can we delight? How can we give people more what's highest 
on their joy list. It's all about lifting people up, not letting people down. It's getting creative. How can we get more creative in the way that we, in the way that we really give that joy or what's highest on those people's joy list? Lifting people up, not letting people down. Now, I've been a professional speaker now for, gosh, I'm embarrassed to admit, 37 years I've been doing this. And for 25 of those 37 years, I'm really very fortunate I had the same assistant, who was just wonderful. After working together for one year, we sat down and we said, okay, how can we better serve our customers and how can we better serve each other? So we came up with one idea that made all the difference in the world. We came up with job descriptions for each other. And the job description was the exact same, to create each other's perfect world. Now my perfect world revolves around more joy, less hassle. I think all of our perfect worlds in some way probably have that equation, right? I mean, I want to come and go as I please. I want the freedom to create. I want a chance to make a difference in whatever unique way I want to make a difference in the world. So if you ask Nancy what she did for me, she would say, the stuff that doesn't show, which was really everything. Now Nancy's perfect world revolved around this guy. Oh, listen, I, I'm a, we'll get back to this slide in one second. <laughs> this guy, that's the guy. <laughs> yeah, not uh, this guy, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's Nancy's son. Uh, big ears. Uh, <laughs> well, she, uh, it's, it's a long story. It was going to be my breakthrough story. She had an affair with a, a creature. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Back to Nancy. David. That's David. That's Nancy's, that's Nancy's son. And uh, so when David was young and living at home, uh, sh whatever I could do to give more time to Nancy to spend time with David would... You know, during summer when school was out, during teacher in services, and then David got older, went off to college, and so I knew if I really wanted to make Nancy happy, every time I surprised her, it was going to involve David. And over the years, we had some amazing surprises. One of my very favorites was her 50th birthday. She was, David was going to school in Washington State at the time, and uh, he called a couple weeks before the big birthday and says, oh, mom, I'm so sorry, I'm I'm not going to be able to come home for your birthday because we have a big test that I can't make up, so I'm going to have to make it up to you later. Well, she was really disappointed, but she understood. Morning of her 50th birthday, she's working a half day. Phone rings. She thinks it's a client by the way that I'm talking. October 23rd, uh, can you hold on one minute, please? Nancy, can you do me a favor? Can you run to the trunk of my car and grab my road calendar out? These were the days when we had a, remember when you had a road calendar, like a, what were they, those things called day timers or yeah, productivity planners, whatever it was. So uh, she'd done this before, so she runs outside, opens up the trunk of my car. There's David in the trunk. Surprise! And once we revived her, <laughs> she was somewhere close to that perfect world. So how do we create the perfect world of Nancy and her, and her second son, Airbird? <laughs> uh, listen actively, right? I mean, sure we can take advantage of all the technology that we have to get us closer to our clients and our, and our teams or to learn, but we can check on social media, we can do it that way. But simply listening. There's such a, a, there's a, a big difference between hearing and listening. Hearing is a physical act, right? You, you, when we hear, we hear things, but we don't really process things, right? To, to listen, there are waves, earwaves sent to our brain for interpretation. If you've read Stephen Covey's work or familiar with his seven habits of highly effective people, listen to understand, seek to understand, right? I mean, in order to, to truly listen, we have to interpret what they are saying so that we can give you know, give the appropriate uh, response, knowing what they want. I'm in Singapore, and I'm going to meet with a client in about an hour, and I told them I would I'd WhatsApp them about where we we're going to meet, and I was looking for a, an internet connection because I needed to show them some things, and, 
So I went to a restaurant that would be perfect, had a nice view, and uh, I asked the, the host, I said, hey, do you guys, do you have, you have internet here? And he says, ah, nope, sorry, no internet. I'm I said, well, maybe I'll just try to see if I can pick up a signal from somewhere. And sure enough, the entire mall is wired for internet. I'm like, well, it's wireless. I'm like, oh, wow. So I said to the, ho- the, 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 the hostess, I said, uh, I go, you, uh, you said you, you didn't have internet. Actually, you do have internet because the whole mall, well, you didn't ask me if the mall had internet. You asked if we had internet. I'm thinking, like, is that really listening to understand? Because what are we trying to do when we're listening? We're trying to solve problems. We're trying to learn more about people. We're trying to give them a little bit more of truly what they want in their, in their lives, right? right? So in creating the perfect world of, of those in our lives, we truly need to pay attention. We, we truly need to, to listen. How can we make life incrementally better for those in our lives? We've all heard the... By, by being leaders, uh, we, we've heard this term before, under-promise and over-deliver, right? Yeah? Yeah. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little different slant on it today. It's the under-promise. That is where, the, where we need to focus a little bit more on. Because being leaders, being people pleasers like so many of us are, we, we make promises based on everything happening just perfectly from the time that we make the promise to the time that we deliver the promise. It doesn't always happen that way. All right, play with me for a minute. Let's just say that you move to a new city and you want to find out which, which uh, you're, you're into photography, okay? You're, you're now all photographers. So there's Photoshop A and Photoshop B. You take your photos, you take your little, fo- your little disc, you take the Photoshop A, they tell you that they will have it done the next day by, uh, they promise you, to have it done by 12 o'clock, okay? Photoshop B tells you 3 o'clock. Right down the street, you go there next, all right? Photoshop A tells you 12. Photoshop B tells you 3 o'clock. Photoshop A actually finishes the next day at 2.30. They told you noon. Photoshop B finishes at 2.45. They told you 3 o'clock. Which Photoshop actually performed the task the quickest? How many say A? Look around, no hands. How many say B? Uh, most hands. How many of you lost me somewhere in translation? A few of you. <laughs> you shouldn't have lost me in translation. No. Uh, okay, so which is quicker? 2.30 or 245? My question is, which Photoshop quinit finished the quickest? 230 is right? Hey, how come everyone always says that B finished it the quickest? Why? Because, the, because they told you 3 o'clock, so they're actually 15 minutes quicker. So you see the power of under-promising and over-delivering? But it's so hard to do because we always promise too much to begin with. And then it's harder to follow through like we want. So be careful the way we under-promise and over-deliver. And it's not just taking care of our customers, right? I mean, today, you look, at, uh, you look at studies. Gallup just did a big survey. The number one concern of HR directors around the world today is worried about talent, not having the right talent. Because we are now in a borderless talent situation, right? Because we can get talent from just about anywhere, and they, they, if, they're, if they're in demand, they can pretty much dictate the terms. You know, I'll come in once a month to the office, but I'm going to live here on the beach. I mean, it's kind of a nice that what COVID did for us, really. All right, but uh, so we need to make sure that we, we really do take care of those on our teams and that, that we're doing the right things to attract the right talent. So that little photo of the, the guy there is Scott Bemis in the corner. Scott Bemis is a former president and publisher of the Denver Business Journal. Before they hire anybody at the Denver Business Journal, he would have a conversation with them. And it went something like this. He'd say, if you come to work here at the Denver Business Journal, can we make an agreement that this will be the best job you've ever had? I mean, they don't even know what the job really entails yet. I mean, sure, it's written on paper, but you don't really know until you're you're there, right? So what is he really trying to find out? Trying to find out, you know, how they how they approach, what their attitude is about work. 
can they make this their perfect job, right? So if they can see it, if they can, if they can feel it, then they're still candidates for this job. If not, no, then next. Only those that can see it. And then whoever he hires for that open job position, on the first day of work, he will tell them all the reasons they were hired over the other candidates. He wants to make them feel really good. You know, get them set for working there. Then he will remind them of the conversation that they had. And he said, okay, remember the, making this your perfect job? This is a two-way street. We have to figure out a way to now to make this happen. Because I am going to be accessible to you. I'm going to be resourceful. I am going to set you up with the resources that you need to be successful. Right? And then we're going to check back in and we're going to try we're going to figure out how you can love your job more. Okay? Too often employee engagement today is a one-way street, right? I mean as companies in this war on talent, we're we're supposed to okay, we're here's the packages we're going to here's the benefits Here's, a, here's how we are going to engage you. But engagement really needs to be a two-way street. There needs to be a conversation about how this works. So what can we do to make sure that we're listening better, that we really are taking care of our teams? Because uh, as, as we've learned from Yana and we know how important it is, emotional wellness is, is one of the most critical things in, in business today. works much better when the mic's right here. <laughs> Finally, she said, okay, hold that thought. Like just before we get there, you with me? Finally, she said, we'll be right back. I've got to tell you what Richard Branson said first. Richard Branson said, <laughs> he said that business is real simple. He said the key to business today is first you take care of your employees. Then you take care of your customers. And then you take care of your shareholders. But if you do it in that order, everybody is taken care of. You familiar with uh, AirAsia? You know, they have AirAsia Philippines and uh, the, uh, Tony Fernandez, the founder from Malaysia, he said the most the most critical job, his number one responsibility as CEO of AirAsia is to unleash diamonds. Is to really bring out the full potential in all their employees. Okay, where were we? Oh yeah, I remember now. Finally, she said, sit down. So I, I took my chair and I wedged it right in the corner of the table. Really the only place you could put a chair was on the, on the corner. And I, I introduced myself. I said, hi, I'm, I'm Scott. I'm from Colorado. And they introduced themselves around the table. They were a family from Poland. They had come to the United States via Canada. We're now living in a suburb in Chicago. So do you remember the assignment? The assignment was start a meaningful conversation with someone you wouldn't normally talk to. So how do you take a conversation, one of just chat, and make it meaningful, right? So I was thinking of, you know, how do I, how do I make that transition into something a little bit more meaningful? And all of a sudden, John at the far end of the table, silver streak back, white hair, piercing blue eyes, deep wrinkles around his eyes. He looked at me and he said, he's a Scott, are you a Jew? Am I a Jew? You know, Justin's a Jew, he's told us a couple of times, but uh, I mean, how would you, I'd like, I'm like, John, I said, uh, as a matter of fact, I am Jewish. He says, well, then we need to go talk. And he came across the table and he grabbed me by the arm and he took me to a table at the very back of the food court. And he started to tell me about World War II. He said, Scott, when the Germans invaded Poland, they took me and my family and they, they put us in this work camp and, and things were bad in the camp. But not across, not as bad as they were across the tracks where they, where they kept the Jews. He said, not one hour went by when there wasn't some kind of screaming. 
And I always wanted to do something, but I, I couldn't. And I didn't. And then, one morning, the screaming had stopped. And I never had a chance to say, I'm sorry. They're gone. You're here. I'm sorry. Tears were streaming down his face. Tears were now streaming down my face. <coughs> and here I thought this exercise was all about me. Some of the biggest blessings in life, some of the biggest lessons in life, our biggest breakthroughs, are when we realize it's not about us. It's about them. Our teams. Those that we serve. We talked a little while longer. I went back to, I said goodbye to John. I went back to class. And for the next, for the next three hours, we, talk, we, we all told our stories. And then we debriefed with it, what it meant. And it really came down to how we approach fear in our lives. If you think about your most defining moments, your biggest lessons learned, your breakthroughs, are they when you're moving toward fear or away from fear? Toward fear, right? Sometimes we're thrown into fear. COVID-19 is a good example. Uh, business failures, divorces, health issues. Other times when we know there's something better out there, we move toward fear by choice. And that's where the biggest lessons in life come. You're not scared. It's not big enough. Comfort never produced greatness. If I had to sum up life in one sentence, I would say the quality of life is determined by the quality of our relationships. And men and women are so much different about relationships, aren't they? I mean, don't you love two women who haven't seen each other in a long time, how they respond in most cultures? <gasps> it's you. Honey, uh, who was that? Who was that lady? Oh, uh, some lady I met at the market about six months ago. For the life of me, I can't remember her name. Two guys haven't seen each other in a long time. How do they respond? Honey? Honey, who's that guy? That's Frank. You remember Frank? Frank is the guy that gave me the kidney. Hey, Frank, thanks for the kidney. I really appreciate it. Here. Remember when you were young and your mom says, Honey, it's much better to give than receive. And you're thinking to yourself, Is she nuts? And then you got involved in a cause. Maybe what's, it's what you're doing today. And you realize what Albert Schweitzer said is right. He said he doesn't know what your future will bring. But what he does know is that those of us that will truly be the most happy are the ones that have sought and found a way to serve. Luciano de Crescenza said, we're all angels, but with only one wing. And only by embracing each other, we fly. I think that's why we do this work, with Together We Can Change the World. And I challenge you to take that journey with us, and I know many of you are already on that journey, is helping others fly. Never forget how many people we can help to fly. <clears throat>